This is CBC Here and Now. I have a seat for now. Devin Haru in Conception Bay South Arena. It's going to be standing room only in a few hours, though. Gushu versus Kui. A big curling game tonight. I've got you covered with a preview. Well, thanks, Devin. It's good to have you back on Here and Now. Good evening. I'm Anthony Germain. The government is facing a new investigation tonight into the Mitchellmore scandal, and this time it's not the decision to hire Liberal staffer Carla Foote into a position at the rooms, but it's about deleted emails and a lack of documentation that will face more scrutiny. Here now is Peter Cowan, is actually a key player in this story, and as you see, Peter is live tonight with us. So, Peter, what exactly is going on here? What's, what's being investigated? Anthony, more than a year ago, I asked for all the records related to Carla Foote's hiring from the Department of uh, Tourism, Culture, Industry and Innovation. And I got lots of emails from people outside of government who were concerned about the hiring, but there wasn't a single email sent either within government or from the government to the rooms related to her hiring. Now, I thought that was a bit odd, but it wasn't until we saw the Mitchell Moore report that we got a little more idea of what exactly was happening. And I'm not the only one who's had a look at these documents. The Information and Privacy Commissioner has had a look at this, and he finds it odd as well. I have seen that particular fulfilled access request, and uh, it is something that raises, raises my eyebrows, uh, and that is worth, worthy of asking some questions about. Now, we know from the report that the department sent a letter uh, to the head of the rooms that he was supposed to use to terminate the person to make room for Carla Foote. Now, that email wasn't included in the documents that I got. The investigation into the hiring found that government officials told the rooms to delete it. You knew this was going to get A-tipped, so I would like to have my records neat and tidy, final versions lined up, is what the deputy minister told the citizen's representative. Now, government officials are allowed to, de to delete records as long as they're records that are essentially temporary. They're supposed to keep things that are final versions or final decisions. So, did this break the rules? Well, that's going to be one of the key questions for the commissioner. If a document is deleted with the intent to evade a TIPA, then that's an offense under the Act. I feel the public needs to have confidence that there is nothing untoward going on in this, uh, in this instance. Now, because I was the person who filed the original request, I am the person who also filed that appeal with the Information and Privacy Commissioner, someone anyone who files an access request can do. So now we're going to have to see what the Commissioner finds out when he does his investigation, Anthony. All right, Peter, that's Peter Cowan reporting live in our newsroom. To other news now, it's a victory of sorts for a St. John's woman who's been fighting for access to medicine to prevent her from going blind. Krista Stevens lobbying for eye injections to prevent blindness seems to have worked, but as Sees Hair reports, Stevens says the fight may not be over just yet. It'll be a good Christmas this year for Krista Stevens. She's not facing the terrifying possibility of going blind. There's relief now that she can get a drug that'll prevent blindness as a result of her disease. To be able to wake up every day, no, I'm not going to go blind tomorrow or six months from now and hopefully I'll never have to worry about it again. Excellent, your testing today looks great. She was getting eye injections to keep the blindness at bay, but her treatment stopped due to the cap under the provincial drug program. And when those treatments stopped, she switched to generic meds. And that made things worse. She went public. NDP MHA Jim Din lobbied on her behalf. You really need to rely on the professional judgment of the medical professionals, and they're in the best position um, to, to make, the, uh, make the decision what their patients need. We also have uh, reports from the Canadian Ophthalmological Society and the Canadian Retinal Society that uh, back up this, that the caps are counterproductive. Government said Thursday it's eliminating the cap for people under the provincial drug program. Great news for Krista, but she's not celebrating yet. Unless you have been where I've been and you've sat there and you've been told you're going to go blonde if you don't get these. They don't, you don't know what it's like. And I think if this was happening to Mr. Haggy himself or anyone who had the power to change this, I don't think this cap would have existed to begin with. Stevens feels she has to fight for people outside of the provincial drug plan. Just the thought of losing your eyesight when you know there's something available to stop it. 
There's so many eye diseases you can't cure, you can't stop. And here we are with something that's available. And the government just doesn't want to spend money on it here. She says it's a matter of fairness. Coverage for some and not for all, she says, doesn't make sense. Cease Hair, CBC News, St. John's. Well, you heard Krista make mention there of Health Minister John Hagee. Well, he says the changes to the drug program already announced, along with the co-pay program in place for people with private insurance, is about all that the province can do. And he says it's now up to private drug insurance companies to change how much coverage they provide. But the minister says the answer to this problem is a national pharmacare program, and he encourages Stevens to reach out to federal representatives in Ottawa. <laughs> Happy Friday, everyone. Time for a look at your weekend weather forecast, starting with the weather on the way headlines. Looking like a pretty sunny Saturday for most of the province tomorrow, but then Saturday evening, we have some weather moving through, lots of rain, lots of wind, and some mild temperatures for Sunday. Plus, Labrador is going to see a snowstorm starting on Saturday evening into Sunday. This is how the system will play out. Lots of rain you can see for the island, and on Sunday, lots of snow for Labrador, lots of weather warnings in place. I'll get into all those details later. Well, the cold day that Ms. Stokes ordered up for today, the nippy temperatures, they weren't enough to keep young climate protesters away from the Confederation building today. Striking students again took the day off to ask political leaders to declare a climate emergency in this province. The young people are taking their inspiration from Greta Thunberg's Fridays for Future campaign, but one organizer, another Greta, says it's not enough to march to the confed and wave signs. She says the government needs to listen and change its policy making. Newfoundland and Labrador wants to double its oil and gas uh, production by 2030, which is the opposite of what we need to be doing. We should be banning the production of single-use plastics. We should declare states of climate emergency on the provincial and federal levels. So when lawmakers are making laws, they have to put the climate crisis at uh, the top of their list of concerns. So legislation like that would definitely make me feel, and I think everybody here, a lot better about our futures. A new president has been named to run St. Bonds, a historic private Catholic school in St. John's. Stephen Handrigan will leave his job at a choir school in Toronto to return home. He's taking over as St. Bonaventure's College as it is still recovering from a fraud scandal. Trust at the K-12 school was shattered after a courtroom heard how its accountant stole more than half a million dollars. And the way she siphoned off the money went undetected for three years. Well, Handrigan grew up in St. John's and much of his teaching and school administration career has been with Catholic schools in Toronto. Right now, he is the executive director at St. Michael's Choir School. He'll take over at St. Bonds in August. Well, some families in Central received an unexpected gift from a pair of Good Samaritans. This is a fantastic story. An anonymous couple called up Rift's department store last week offering to pay off some layaway bills. Now, the couple said they are not exchanging Christmas gifts this year. Instead, they wanted to help a few families in Gander and Clarenville pay off their debts. Sue Wareham is the manager of Rift's in Clarenville, and she says the kindness had more than a few people in tears, including her. Well, for the last 16 years, there's a heartwarming holiday tradition at the Collision Clinic in St. John's. They give away a car to a family that needs one. And this year's giveaway just happened to coincide with a birthday. Happy birthday, dear Maggie. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. Well, seven-year-old Maggie and her mother Catherine Costello are the 29 recipients of Collision Clinic's Enriching Lives Car Giveaway. They received a refurbished 2018 Nissan. See smiles there. The company says the annual giveaway is their way of paying it forward. The employees volunteer their time on evenings and weekends to repair the vehicle so that it's safe and reliable. And in addition to the car, the company pays for a year of registration as well as the insurance. And since this year's announcement also fell on Maggie's birthday, the staff also threw in a little birthday party for the girl. Oh my goodness, this is so what a day for her. 
Well, now to a big event in sports in our area. 30 of the top men's and women's curling teams from around the world are on the ice this weekend in Conception Bay. All week, in fact. Now, the Grand Slam of curling, it heads into the finals tomorrow. CBC's Devin Haru is in CBS tonight, and as you see, he joins us live. Devin, always good to see you. You're obviously there in the stands as the fans keep piling up. How's it going? In the middle of Gushu country, Anthony, it's great to be talking to you again, and it's great to be back on the rock for a major curling event. Yes, this is the calm before the granite storm because we know that Gushu and Kui are going to be taking to the ice, and we know that these fans are going to be ready. Yes, I have a seat right now, but in a couple of hours from right now, it's standing room only inside Conception Bay South Arena for this big showdown. I should tell you, Anthony, that Gushu and Kui haven't met in a game of significance on the rock since that magical night, March 2017. Nobody will forget it. I was inside Mile One Center when Gushu and the boys brought out the brooms. They were sweeping and they brought that rock to the house and the place went crazy. No doubt these fans here tonight want a similar scene playing out here. But let me tell you, it's great to be back in a place where curling matters. Anthony, I've told you this story before, but I had an elderly woman, a Gushu fan, come up to me in the middle of that St. John's Briar and say, if Gushu was playing tiddlywinks, we would sell out that arena as well. And so that gives you a sense of how excited people are for curling here. I should also tell you a lot of questions being asked about whether or not another slam is going to be, be uh, brought back here to Newfoundland and Labrador. It's kind of a traveling circus, this curling tour. It's tough to get out here. But from what I'm hearing, Anthony, they want an event back on the rock. I'm going to do everything I can to get it back here because it's always good to be back here and a big game tonight. Uh, later in the show, of course, I'll be talking about some of the numbers we should pay attention between okay. Kui and Gushu. It's their 61st meeting. A lot of history between these two, Anthony. All right, Devin, always good to talk to you and I look forward to speaking to you a little bit later in here and now. Take it easy. You bet.
Um, personally, I feel a warm meal is being able to um, stay together with family and share a very delicious meal on a Christmas day. Yeah. The food bank does a really important job, especially in the holidays, to have people, have everybody enjoy that Christmas spirit. A warm meal means comfort. Uh, a warm meal means a full belly. Yeah, a warm meal for me sounds like family and sounds like uh, good times. <laughs> uh, to me it means community. A warm meal means a kitchen stock with ingredients to make it. It means that a lot to me that I have the capacity uh, to have a nice warm meal. A warm meal can warm more than one cup. One warm meal won't solve food insecurity on the East Coast. But at least it's a start. And on that warm hearts note, thank you uh, for everybody who watched last night, made donations online, as well as those of you who came to the mall. Yeah, it was a fun night. It was a fun night with a few surprises here and there. <laughs> Uh, we talk about the weather, the highs, as Carolyn Stokes called Not them. too high today. Yeah. It was a cold one in St. All Saint with John's. a negative mark in front yeah, of it. Yeah, really cold right across the province. Yeah. And uh, going to stay pretty chilly tomorrow. But then on Sunday, we're going to get another one of those warm-ups coming. Double digits for St. So John's on shovel? Sunday. Uh, no. Okay. No, it's going to be wet. Mother Nature can shovel. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, let's have a look at the highs today. It actually only got up to uh, minus 7 in St. John's today, and minus 17, really, it felt like with the wind chill. And look at uh, Labrador City, minus 24 there today, so some very cool temperatures right across the province. So this evening, things are staying fairly quiet. Some flurries for the West Coast, but everywhere else looking at a very calm, clear, cold evening. Uh, St. John's minus 8 as the overnight low. Fairly strong winds though. Northwesterly 30 gusting to 50. Uh, Marystown could see a few flurries overnight tonight. Cornerbrook as well with minus 5 as the overnight lows and some fairly light westerly winds. Very cold in St. Anthony minus 16 overnight tonight night and uh, in Labrador, Nain looking at a wind chill of minus 34 overnight, but clear skies right across the board. Labrador City staying very cold as well. Minus 24 is the overnight low with the much cooler wind chill. So looking ahead to tomorrow, things stay fairly quiet for much of the day. Some flurries on uh, the west coast for the morning, but uh, you can see the rest of the island looking pretty clear as well for Labrador. But then as we get into Saturday afternoon in the late hours and Saturday evening, we have this system that's going to push on through. But let's have a look at tomorrow first. So minus two as the high in St. John's tomorrow. It's going to feel a bit cooler. Uh, some light winds, lots of sunshine. So it'll be a nice day to get out and do something outdoors, I think. A little bit more cloud cover in the Clarenville area as well for uh, central areas above <laughs> freezing one degree uh, for central tomorrow. A chance of some flurries later in the afternoon for Harbor Breton as well for the Port of Basque area and uh, all above uh, zero gross morn. Uh, at the freezing mark there tomorrow, so not too bad temperature wise. Uh, up in the Straits, a clear day for the Cartwright area, minus 10 as the high there, so pretty chilly as we go uh, farther north. Nain looking at minus 16 tomorrow, and uh, some cloud cover for the Churchill Falls area, minus 15. And that wind chill staying very cold, minus 25 in the morning, and then as the day goes on, that wind chill will uh, go up to minus 17. So this is the system that's going to be pushing through on. Saturday night. It's a messy one for sure. You can see all of this rain. We're going to have this band of snow that's going to push through first. So it's going to be a quick shot of snow and then lots of heavy rain behind it. So here we are Saturday, 9 o'clock in the evening, and it's just going to continue on in the overnight hours. And for Sunday, then the temperatures are going to stay fairly mild. And Labrador are going to be seeing uh, more of that heavier snowfall uh, Saturday night into Sunday morning. So we do have all of these uh, warnings in effect. We Wind warning for the West Coast, as, as well as a rainfall warning special weather statement for the Conegra and Buren Peninsulas. All of that having to do with the system coming through on Saturday night. Lots of rain, lots of snow, and we have a special weather statement as well for pretty much all of Labrador associated with that system. I'll get into more details about amounts a bit later in the long range. It's protecting all passengers coming into, leaving from, or traveling within, uh, within uh, Canada. 
Coming up, the lowdown on the new rules that you need to know if your flight is ever delayed or canceled in the future. Welcome back to Here Now. Well, just in time for those who fly home for the holidays. As of Sunday, new rules will come into play for air passengers. And tonight on The Lowdown, our CBC Investigate series about consumer news that you can use, reporter Jen White breaks down what those new rules will mean for you. The Canadian government has new rules that will affect everyone boarding a plane. Here's the lowdown on the air passenger protection regulations. The first phase was introduced in July and included things like communicating with passengers about flight disruptions, what happens when a flight is overbooked, and compensation guidelines for passengers that get bumped, how to deal with tarmac delays, and compensation for lost luggage. 
Now, the second phase adds more rules, including children under the age of 14 must be seated near their parent, guardian, or tutor at no extra cost. Passengers will be compensated for flight delays or cancellations that are within the airline's control and not related to safety. That doesn't include weather delays or mechanical problems identified outside of scheduled maintenance. There's also a policy in place for rebooking or refunding passengers on delayed or cancelled flights. If you encounter an issue, you should first try to resolve things with your airline. But if that doesn't work... They can go to the Canadian Transportation Agency, the CTA, which is part of Transport Canada, and for, uh, uh, lodge a formal complaint, and it'll be dealt with from there. If an airline doesn't comply with the rules, the company could be fined up to $25,000 for each incident. Howard says the regulations are important so that both travellers and the airlines know what to expect. It also ensures consistency across all airlines across the country. No matter if they're uh, an American airline or a Canadian airline, it's protecting all passengers coming into, leaving from, or traveling within, uh, within uh, Canada. Howard says before heading to the airport, you should familiarize yourself with the new rules. You can do that by checking out the Canadian Transport Agency's website. Well, from Christmas travel to Christmas crimes, this time of year, Canada Post and other couriers are busy delivering millions of packages. Often, they'll leave parcels right on your front step. But an upswing in front porch pirates has some community and small business groups stepping in. CBC's Cameron McIntosh explains. Watch this. Completely out in the open in the middle of the day. He has a duffel bag, mm -hmm. and he picks up the package. And it's, it's not even, yeah, and it's not even that quick. And he, it's quite a big box. Darren caught it all on his doorbell camera. We're not using his last name for fear of other thefts. I was home. I didn't hear anything or yeah. notice anything. Checks his bag if it's going to fit. <laughs> and then he rides off. So there you are. You're watching a video of a theft at your house. Yes, it's, no. it's scary and sad. Making it worse, 36 hours later, it happens again. Even with a camera, it's hard to keep an eye on your front step at all times. So that has some small businesses and community groups looking to offer something a little more secure. It's not just the so-called porch pirates. Even Canada Post's community mailboxes have been targeted. A study conducted for FedEx found 29% of Canadian online shoppers have had something stolen. In Winnipeg, this community centre has set itself up as a safe drop. For a small donation, they'll accept and secure your parcel. We just think it will make our community feel safer, and that's what the community centre is about. Similar idea at this North Winnipeg supplement store. Hey, Barry. Here. Victor hey. Janis is all for it. We had a neighbour that their house uh, did have something stolen, and they said it was within about 15 minutes. We don't want anybody's Christmas presents stolen or a holiday present stolen, so uh, it's a great way, to, you know, like my dad always says, if you can do a little to help a lot, why not? Darren, who managed to get his stolen goods replaced, isn't giving up on online shopping. But now we'll probably get it delivered to a local safe drop. It's good for, the, for me because I know my package will be safe, but it's good maybe to meet small businesses. It's certainly better than watching someone just walk off with it. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg get one of those doorbell cameras for Christmas. Well, photos of Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus in cages outside a California church has caused a social media frenzy in the United States. Here, uh, the group that plans the nativity every year uh, was unanimous in deciding that we had to make the focus the separation of families at the border. Now, this stark display of the family in cages is meant to raise eyebrows, and it certainly does. The church says this nativity scene is meant to draw attention to the separation of families at the U.S.-Mexican border. Now, a spokesperson calls it an ethical, not a political statement. The display has prompted thousands of comments on social media in a backlash and significantly more than any similar past display. Those have included war refugees, mothers in prison, as well as gay couples. Well, here in Canada, a Toronto church is getting a more positive reception to its efforts to share the same message. I have great sympathy for the children who are separated from their parents. And how, who does that, you know? So this is a, a quite powerful. 
the church is trying to send a great message out. It's probably a pretty powerful statement about uh, reality in the world right now. Now, many South American children have been separated from their parents while seeking asylum as well, and they're being detained in different facilities across the U.S.-Mexico border. Well, they like them a lot, eh? That's a pun. Ahead, why this coffee artist's designs are such a huge hit. Welcome back. Just getting some uh, ECHL hockey news here. St. John businessman Dean McDonald, uh, his plan to try to get a second ECHL team in uh, Trois-Rivières in Quebec, that has been rejected. Uh, the mayor of Trois-Rivières has said that there wasn't enough consultation done, so Dean McDonald, he'll have to settle for the growlers here in St. John's, but they have decided he will not get a second ECHL hockey team. Well, let's switch to curling and head back to Conception Bay South now to join CBC's Devin Haru at the Grand Slam of curling. So, Devin, how are things shaping up? They're heading into the finals. Well, listen, fans are starting to pour in here. Uh, a junior basketball team here, Anthony, behind me. They tell me they're going to be handing out Gushu rally towels. So that gives you a sense of the excitement that's starting to build here. It's probably a bigger game for Kui tonight. He has a 2-1 and one record. Gushu 3-0. and oh, The boys from Newfoundland and Labrador undefeated so far. They want to keep the good times rolling here tonight. Here are some eerie numbers for you. It's Friday the 13th, it's draw 13, and these two teams met for the first time 13 years ago, Anthony. But the last time they met here in a game of... It was a 7-6 score. You add those two numbers up, add another 13 in there. I well, here are the Grand I've Slam tonight. And then you... Well, it's a shame we don't actually get uh, Devin on that often, but at least we got him sort of for part of the show tonight. He'll have to have fun and curling uh, without us. It's a pity, too, because apparently, a source tells me, he may be getting screeched in. I can't believe that hasn't happened. He comes here so often. Well, from a screech beverage to a warmer beverage, as the old saying goes, this world is but a canvas. 
Well, for one artist, the foam on top of your latte is his canvas. The New Brunswick man is known online as Barista Brian, and he's traveling the world and meeting celebrities with his latte masterpieces. I'm Brian Leonard, also known as Barista Brian online on Instagram. And uh, I am from Fredericton, New Brunswick, and I travel North America and now the world doing latte art. I've done events for the Oscars and the Emmys. Eight years ago, I moved to Toronto. I had a bartending job at an Italian wine bar where I learned how to make specialty coffee. And I, I loved that so much and thought it was so cool that you could put an image in a latte. <laughs> Eventually, I started to draw my friends' faces and the reaction I got every time was really great. One day on a piece of my latte art online and it kind of took off from there. I, I can't get enough of meeting Meryl Street. And she called me a genius and looked me straight in the eye. Uh, that was great. And Tom Hanks as well was outstanding. And Jennifer Lopez as well was another really big one this year. The day before I met her, she hit 100 million Instagram followers. Daniel Radcliffe, the Harry Potter actor, the first time I met him, I drew just his face. But he was with me the whole time and kind of spent the process with me. And just talk to me and that's my favorite way to make an impression of someone in their drink. I still, you know, I, I proudly tell people in Hollywood that I'm from Fredericton, New Brunswick and I always say it borders on Maine when I'm in the States because <laughs> I'm not sure if they know where I'm from but I, I come home all the time and I, I bring my latte art home and you just, I just never thought that this is what I would be doing with this thing that I love to do which is latte art. So my grandmother taught me to sew when I was about five and I just remember spending a lot of time in her sewing room with her. A childhood passion that is now a full-time job. Up next, the latest in our looking at the province's fashion designers. All right, well, I just paid here, and now it's electricity bill, so we're reconnected with Devin Haru in CBS. So, Devin, we lost you last time, so let's talk about what's at stake tonight. What, what's your sense of what's going on here? 
Nothing like live TV. Hey, Anthony, uh, it's going to be exciting. Of course, everybody's starting to get into their seats. We're a couple of hours away now, less than a couple of hours away from game time. Cooey versus Gushu probably means more for Cooey tonight. He has a two and one record. Gushu three and zero, oh, undefeated. But the boys from Newfoundland and Labrador want to keep the good times rolling. Maybe we lost you because it's Friday the 13th. More on the number. 13. The first time Kui and Gushu ever played a game against each other 13 years ago. And so here they go again. They're going to be on this ice here tonight. They haven't met in a game of significance here on the Rock since that March 2017 night when Gushu won 7 to 6. Add those two numbers up, you have a num uh, another 13. Team. It's going to be a great night here. Then we get into the playoffs. Gushu has already punched his ticket into the playoffs. A men's quarterfinal, 5 p.m. Island time right here. Then the semifinal right after that. And then the men's final. You can watch it on CBC Sports on Sunday. And Anthony, you know everyone wants Gushu to be in that final. So does he. He told me yesterday right here, we need to get a win. We need to get things rolling. They haven't had the best start to the season. They want to hit the reset button right here at home. Okay, now, Devin, you mentioned the number 13. I understand for $13, you could actually get screeched in. Are my sources correct that this has never happened to you, that this might be in your near future? Listen, four trips to the island. I've never been screeched in. The locals heard it. They said that has to change. And so tonight on George Street, I'm kissing the cod, Anthony. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, Devin, always a pleasure. Enjoy the curling, and uh, we'll be following your Twitter account tonight into the wee hours, I suspect. Have a great time. Thank you so much. Always good to chat. Excellent. I get the feeling so Devin, energy. <laughs> I, know, I get the feeling he'd do that whether we paid him or not. Probably. Right? What a Up fireball. Up for anything, mm -hmm. yeah. I find him interesting to see what happens to him later tonight, right? I, I would like Friday that. the 13th. You never know. In. What could go wrong? <laughs> for Nothing. sure on George Street. Yeah. Okay, so uh, are we looking far ahead? Yeah, or? we're going to have a look at the long range, but I'm okay. uh, going to start, though, with uh, another quick look at tomorrow because tomorrow is looking quite nice. Nice oh, day to take your dog out for a walk. Some sunshine in St. John's, minus two as the high there. A chance of some flurries on the west coast in the Corner Brook area in the morning. And uh, minus seven as the high in St. Anthony tomorrow for the rest of Labrador, uh, or for Labrador rather. Lots of sunshine along the coast and cool temperatures, minus 10 in Lab City. So then things really start to change Saturday night. As I mentioned a bit earlier, we have a bit of snow that's going to be coming through, then some mixed precipitation, and then we have lots and lots of rain uh, coming through Saturday night into Sunday morning. Here we are at Sunday, 1 a.m., and uh, it's just going to continue throughout the day, uh, particularly in Labrador. We're going to see some heavier snowfall in Lab City and some mixed precipitation here along the southeastern portion of Labrador. And as I mentioned earlier, there are some warnings in effect. We have a wind warning for the Port of Basque area up through Cornerbrook a rainfall warning for much of the south coast and the special weather statement. The details of all of this are this um, 30 to 50 millimeters of rain for the Conegra and Buren Peninsula expected uh, tomorrow night in through Sunday as well for the west coast. Heaviest rainfall in the Port of Basque, Burgio area could see upwards of 100 millimeters of rain inland uh, over higher elevations and winds gusting up to 120 kilometers an hour. So very wet and very windy. Uh, less rain though for the rest of uh, the west coast there up through Parsons Pond, but it's going to be a lot of uh, downpours. You can expect some downpours and with that frozen ground, there's a risk of some flooding there as well because the ground isn't going, going to be absorbing the water uh, as much as it would otherwise. So for Labrador, Lab City going to mostly see a snowfall event. Could see um, 20 plus centimeters of snow with some high winds on Saturday night into Sunday for Nain and the Hopedale area mostly a snow event they're looking at 25 to 40 centimeters of snow and very high winds as well for the rest of Labrador going to see that mixed precipitation about 10 to 20 cent centimeters of snow expected 10 to 20 millimeters of rain and uh, those high winds continuing there as well temperature wise on Sunday St. John's looking at 12 degrees so it's going to be messy but it's going to be mild as well 
in central areas, 10 degrees for Grand Falls, Windsor, and uh, 9 for the west. In Labrador, looking warmer there as well compared to what it's been like there lately. Happy Valley Goose Bay looking at a high of zero. Cartwright getting above uh, to 2 degrees. So Monday, we're looking at some snow coming through. Those temperatures are going to really drop back down once again. And that wind is going to stick around for a few days uh, in the east. Uh, so so we have that snow coming down on Monday and temperatures going from 12 to minus one and then going to stay in that range as we begin the work week uh, once again for central. That wind going to continue there as well. Temperatures dipping down for the west coast. Similar story. Lots of snowfall as we begin the work week next week and cool temperatures there for Labrador uh, Monday. Snowfall there zero as the high cooling down as we get into Wednesday with minus 12 and a real cool down coming for Lab West minus 20 expected there on Wednesday with some flurries and that's your forecast. Anthony back to you. Thanks, Carol. Well, on social media, a lot of people still talking about the drama in the House of Assembly before it wrapped up last week. Well, now there's a low key drama playing out on Parliament Hill and it's all about a fight over some prime office space. Independent MB, MP rather Jody Wilson Raybould is refusing to move out of the suite of offices assigned to her when she was a Liberal cabinet minister. Well, the Liberals want to offer that prime real estate to one of their newly appointed ministers. David Cochran explains. The Liberals couldn't get her to budge when she held the office of minister. Now she won't budge from her old minister's office. At issue, a cluster of six offices on the fourth floor of this building. Twice the space a normal MP gets. In parliamentary terms, it's a ministerial suite. So I'm not trying to um, prevent somebody from having or being out in the cold without an office. I'm just trying to find a reasonable solution. Wilson Raybould calls the move request petty, but she's a non-minister occupying a ministerial suite which the government needs. Minister of Northern Affairs. For this minister, Dan Vandell, a Métis from Manitoba and the new Minister of Northern Affairs. She kept the offices after quitting cabinet over the SNC-Lavalin controversy, but with a new parliament and a new cabinet, the Liberals want them back. Her supporters made this dispute public at a recent Assembly of First Nations meeting. I heard that um, they were going to try to um, boot you out of your office. <laughs> I dare them to even consider even doing that. Um, that's your space, you've created that space, you've earned that space, and so I'm glad to hear that it was blessed um, today. Blessed by an Algonquin elder just last week, invited by Wilson Rabel to pray for the protection of the space. I just want to stay in my office, which I had blessed by an elder and felt comfortable there. She's offered to give up half of the offices as long as she can stay in the other half. The Liberals want it all for a full minister. All of this is now in the hands of the speaker to resolve, but when it comes to picking offices, the rules are pretty clear. The government gets to go first, the official opposition second, the third party third, and so on. Independents like Wilson Raybould, they have to choose from the leftovers. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, the Speaker of the House of Commons says they are working to resolve the issue, and he points out there's a tradition in place for choosing offices and enforcing the regulations. Be someone from my office who has to enforce the rules so that Parliament can function. I mean, if you would imagine uh, parliamentarians sticking into their, uh, into their offices all along, so we would have to build more and more offices that would, uh, would have uh, ministers uh, in them. So you can imagine, okay, she's not a minister or he's not a minister this time. The next time, well, we've got to find a ministerial suite. What do we do? Uh, we can't just keep building buildings. I mean, I think Canadians would have a problem with that. Now, since the story first sort of developed today, it appears that Ms. Uh, Raybould Wilson has decided to you know, start measuring other options. So stay tuned to CBC and check out our website for the very latest on this as it develops through the weekend. All right, tonight we have the second in our three-part series looking at fashion designers in Newfoundland and Labrador. Designer Megan Jackman's childhood passion eventually led to her full-time job. And she's behind the St. John's handbag company, Ragmaw. She recently spoke with freelance video producer, Leanne Morrison.
So my grandmother taught me to sew when I was about five and I just remember spending a lot of time in her sewing room with her like rummaging through fabrics and coming up with things I wanted to make. Um, my business began about six years ago. I was working as a pharmacist and I just wanted to kind of get back into being creative. Started selling my bags to friends, going to small markets and then it just kind of grew from there. My grandparents were really proud when I did pharmacy and became a pharmacist. I think that this career change has been completely unexpected on their end, but um, they're pretty happy with what I'm doing now. I have been making bags since I was a little girl. I started sewing when I was five, but I had a particular interest in bags. And like I said, I'm just interested in the structure. Um, I'm interested in, in the planning from the inside out. Um, and also, I love fashion myself, so it was either gonna be clothes or accessories, and bags was just something I was really drawn to. So ragma is a Newfoundland term used to describe a child or usually a woman dressed in tattered or ragged clothing. Sometimes it might be a term of endearment. When I started my business, I just had it under my own name, but I didn't really like the way that felt or the direction that I thought it could take just under my own name. And we started looking through the Newfoundland Dictionary and the word ragma popped up and my grandmother remembered using that word a lot when she was growing up. I had never heard of it before. Then I, I looked online and you could get the um, dot com and you could get the Instagram handle, so I, I went with it. I really liked the word. Our bags are special because most of them feature our own fabrics and the fabrics are created from my um, hand drawings. So I draw the images first on paper, then the images get digitized and then turned into fabrics. So our bags feature um, a little piece of, of my art and then also the combination of materials that we use. I think that just allows our bags to kind of stand on their own. I really love that I get to um, create the direction for my business and I get to create the experience that I want my customers to have. It's really empowering for me, but it's also empowering for our customers to be able to say, this is what we'd like to see, this is what we like, this is what we don't like, and we can kind of bounce off each other to um, create a, a, a product that they love, that I'm proud of as well. Check out this oh, fabulous wow. viewer photo. It reminds me of like a scene from Game of Thrones. <laughs> like any second we're gonna see a night walker come out through the mist. <laughs> Just a great shot. Any ideas where this might was taken? I'll let the audience decide. Yeah, I'll let you know after the break.
Well, let's find out who's celebrating anniversaries and birthdays. Happy 99th birthday tomorrow to Josephine Struck from Newfoundland, who turns 99 tomorrow. Happy 90th birthday to Elizabeth Dennis in Deer Lake. And a happy birthday on Monday to Walter Ricketts from Musgrave Town. Happy 91st birthday to Sadie Chaffee in Gander. And a happy 92nd birthday to Eddie Williams from the Goulds. On Wednesday, it was a big 60th anniversary to Harold and Joyce Janes from Cape Ray. Congratulations. Happy 63rd wedding anniversary this Sunday to Henry and Fanny Lynch in Spaniards Bay. Happy 64th anniversary to Frank and Diana Hope from Great Bra. And on Monday, Raymond and Eileen Blundell of Hickman's Harbor, Random Island, celebrated their 62nd anniversary. Happy 60th anniversary to William and Jesse Hollett. They celebrated on Sunday. Also, last Sunday was the 61st anniversary for Jim and Rena O'Driscoll from Carboneer. And on Monday, it was the 90th birthday for Shirley Patricia Lady Croft Lundrigan. She lives in Mount Pearl. And Wednesday, it was a happy 92nd birthday for Beulah White, also in Mount Pearl. And a happy 90th birthday to Mr. Alva Wolfrey in Cornerbrook. And a happy 93rd birthday to Cyril Blackmore in Grand Falls, Windsor. And on Wednesday, Melvie Hutchings celebrated her 100th birthday in Spaniards Bay in Christmas Red, no doubt. Wilfred and Geraldine Gowdy last Saturday celebrated their 60th anniversary. Last Sunday, also a big day for Roger and Gertie Short in Deer Lake. They celebrated 71 years of marriage. Happy 54th anniversary to Marilyn and Harvey Bennett next Tuesday. They're in Bay Roberts. On Wednesday, it was the 59th wedding anniversary for Rachel and Winston Robson in Deer Lake. Ralph and Olive Fudge from Lewisport celebrated their 67th anniversary on Tuesday. And it was a 60th anniversary on Wednesday to Eric and Marion Humphreys from Northern Arm. Happy 63rd wedding anniversary yesterday to Josea and Patience Paul from Gambo. And happy 57th wedding anniversary tomorrow to Winfield and Iris Saunders in Point Leamington. Happy 53rd anniversary to Doris and Gary Reed in Port Saunders. And wishing Harvey and Ethel Stringer in Hickman's Harbor a happy 50th anniversary. And happy birthday to Agnes Mulcahy in Cape Broyle. She turns 90 on Sunday. Rosie McLean celebrated her 93rd birthday Tuesday in Flowers Cove. And a happy 91st birthday tomorrow to Amelia Dunphy. And a happy 101st birthday to Millicent Moss who celebrates on December 13th. This picture was taken this past summer enjoying a little ride on a side-by-side. -side. <laughs> happy 59th anniversary tomorrow to Alexander and Eunice Cull in Lewisport. On Wednesday, it was a happy 60th wedding anniversary for Jean and Cater Best in Gander. Happy 74th wedding anniversary uh, yesterday to Chesley and Lavinia Howell in Paradise. Yesterday also marked 57 years together for Walter and Margaret Alcock in leading Tickles. Happy 51st anniversary to Bill and Loretta Slaney. Happy 66th wedding anniversary to Martin and Nita Rideout from Twillingate, who celebrated on December 10th. And happy 53rd anniversary this Sunday to Pauline and Leslie Parsons from Labrador City. A happy 54th wedding anniversary this coming Monday to Bernard and Sherry Lane in Botwood. And last Sunday, Frank Pinsent in Grand Falls, Windsor turned 90. Congratulations. And happy birthday to Jane Oram, who turned 97 yesterday. Jane lives in Glovertown. Nice sparkly blue dress there, Jane, as well. Yeah, fine crowd. Yeah. Let's have a look at our viewer photo. Isn't this great? I it's love a piece this of one. art. It really is. The texture of it. And it was taken. I got away up there. Yes. Makovic. In Makovic. What a gorgeous shot. Lovely. Gary Anderson uh, sent this in, and he, he sent it in with the subject starting to catch over. Yep. Freezing and up. Yeah. I, I sent him a note and I was like, what does that mean? I wasn't sure. So yes, starting to freeze over. Nice mist there too. Mm -hmm. Well, that uh, show went flying right by really and um, really glad that you could tune in and we'll see you on Monday. Hope you have a great weekend. Yeah, have a great weekend. Good night.